Good morning, family. My name is Eddie, and I am the lead pastor here at Grace Covenant Church. Thank you for being with us. A few things before we get into the service. Uh, First of all, I am excited to remind you all that we are reopening on August 2nd. We are reopening our Sunday morning service, 10 a.m. at Dominion High School. And so I'm excited about this, and I hope that you're excited as well. This is going to be an exciting moment for us to get together, for us to connect uh, and, and I'm hoping that you will be willing to, to join us. If you are, you can register now at, sterling, uh, at gracecov.org slash sterling. Now, it's going to be a little different, and we're asking for reg- registrations in order to protect everyone. Uh, we will also be meeting in the gymnasium, which is, which is just a little bit further down the hallway. But it's going to be a good moment. I'm, I'm hopeful for God to, to meet with us, for us to be encouraged to see one another's faces. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing you. Um, secondly... I wanted to speak a little bit further about what happened last week. Now, if you, if you paid attention to the service last week, we mentioned that Pastor Sean Clemens was attacked at a, uh, a class that was being taught at our Chantilly location. Uh, he was teaching a, a regular Life of Grace, Life in the Spirit class, and uh, one of the people involved in the class attacked him. He was subdued. The, the person who was attacking had been subdued by two other individuals, and, and thankfully, uh, he was taken into custody by the police. But this is a moment where Pastor Sean was in church. We were all in church. Uh, and, and the question is, what should we do when we experience real suffering? Pastor Sean experienced real suffering, not just because he made a bad decision. He, he was doing nothing wrong. And in fact, he was suffering. He was, he was doing the work of God. And now, We will experience different things in our life that happen as a result of our faithfulness to Christ. And the question is, how should we think about the suffering that we experience as we follow Christ? How should we think about the suffering that we experience as we follow Christ? And so I'm going to be reading out of Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Just one verse. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. It says this, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you love us and that your love and your sovereign care are greater than even the suffering that we experience. That, that your care for us doesn't stop when things become difficult. Your care for us doesn't, doesn't end when we experience suffering. But you use difficulty, you use affliction, tribulation, suffering, and ultimately you, you use it for our good. And so God, I pray that we would be able to endure with faith the suffering that, that it, we might experience as a result of of our faithfulness to you. Lord, that we might be able to say that we, we fellowship with you in the fellowship of suffering. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be in here in this moment and you would teach us as we study your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. So we, we read one verse and, and it's of this big book called Revelation and, and sometimes we can get caught up on different views and 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 expectations of what this means, and, and how should we interpret that. But I don't want us to get sidetracked from what's, what's really present here in this one verse, the fact that we're hearing from a unique individual who has something specific to say about suffering in Christ. So who is this person that we're speaking, or that we're hearing from? It, it's John. He says, I, John, and he goes on to talk about how he's your brother and, and partaker in the tribulation kingdom and patient endurance that are in Christ Jesus and he goes on to talk about how he's been uh, on this isle of, uh, island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This John is the Apostle John. Most uh, conservative commentators say that this is the Apostle John, the same John who was one of the three disciples in Jesus' inner circle. You had Peter, James, and John. You had the 12 disciples that Jesus would take and he'd teach them and and train them, but then sometimes he would pull the three back, James, John, and Peter, and he would teach them specific things only. This is John, the son of Zebedee, the brother of James. Um, it, it's the one whom Jesus loved, 
It says in John 20, verse 2, uh, this was the way that John, as he was writing the gospel, he referred to himself as the one that Jesus loved. He was, sto- he was so struck by the fact that Jesus loved him that, that he referred to himself, not as John, but as, as the one that Jesus loved. And this is likely written during the reign of either Nero or uh, Domitian. These were two Roman emperors under which uh, there was a lot of Christian persecution or persecution against Christians. Um, So he's exiled, John the Apostle, exiled to this island called Patmos because of his Christian faith and testimony. It says at the end of of verse 9, he says, I'm on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, he had been preaching and teaching, and because of the persecution that had come, he wasn't necessarily martyred or killed, but he was exiled to Patmos. Now, not only this, but he's likely one of the last disciples to be alive. One of the last of the the 12 disciples. Many of them, if not most of them, had already been martyred, uh, killed for their faith. Uh, We don't know exactly what happened to Thomas, but we know that Peter had had likely been uh, crucified, if not upside down. Um, Paul is likely dead at this point. And so he is one of the last. He's exiled, likely alone, on this island. One of the last living apostles of, uh, of, of Jesus is original 12. And yet he comes to us, and it's interesting, he starts off this, this introduction saying, I, John, your brother. He doesn't begin with an, I, any sort of expression of, of pride or, or of his position as a father in the household. I mean, he is, he is really one of the statement, statesmen of the church, and yet he says, I, John, your brother. He was close to Jesus, and he saw Jesus and, and he, he recognized the kind of lifestyle and leadership that Jesus exhibited. And because of that, his, life, his own lifestyle reflected this, this humility. Paul talks about the same thing in, in Philippians, about this idea that when we look at Jesus Christ and we look at his life, it calls us to humility and not pride. He says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and following, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Count others more significant than yourselves. And then he goes on to say, Let each of you not, uh, look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, think this way, which you be- can begin to think this way, because this is how Jesus Christ thinks. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a serpent, servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Paul is teaching the Philippians and, and reminding us that, that in order to follow Christ, we, we must follow in humility. And we see that in John. He is saying he's the brother. He is equal with them. He is not better or worse, but he is one of their brothers, one of our brothers, Christian intimacy, intimacy with Christ, closeness with Christ should yield humility. And in the midst of of persecution and exile, when he could have become bitter and, and had expectations of how his life ought to have gone, he remains humble because he understands that to be a Christian, to be in fellowship with Christ is, is also to be in fellowship with everything that Christ experienced, namely, in this case, suffering. When he experiences the suffering of exile, the suffering of, of pain, he doesn't say, why me? He doesn't say, I, I don't deserve this. He says, I, I've looked to Christ my Lord and I've seen that he suffered and I willingly accept the same fate. So John is the brother. But not only is he the brother, he's the partner in Jesus. He goes on to say, I, John, your brother, and a partner, one who's partnered, connected along the same lines and goals and and alignment, partner in tribulation and in the kingdom and in patient endurance, all of which are in Jesus. He's a partner with those to whom he writes, and ultimately he is a partner with us. He joins in this pursuit of Christ with us. He's a partner in three things, in in tribulation, in the midst of the kingdom, and then finally in patient endurance or or perseverance, we could say. Let's look at this. 
I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation. John is writing this letter as part, uh, in part to encourage the church that Christ has secured victory. They are in the midst of real persecution. We, we, some, like I said, some commentators think that this is during the, the time of Nero. Others think that it's a little bit later on during the time of uh, uh, Domitian. And either way, either one of those, those emperors, they, they persecuted the Christian church. And we see that there's persecution happening, pain, suffering, people losing their jobs, even losing their lives for the sake of Christ. And so John writes this letter, the letter, letter of Revelation, uh, as an expression of what, what Jesus Christ has told him, that there is coming a victory. There is coming a, a, an ultimate wedding feast of, of Christ and his church, and he wins, and if he wins, we win. And so he says, I am your partner in tribulation. In this time between Christ's death and his second coming, in this moment of tribulation, I am here with you. Tribulation is, simple, is, is simply trouble that causes distress. It can be sometimes uh, very acute, but sometimes it can be fairly minor, but it is, it's painful. And in this life, tribulation will come. And James reminds, of, reminds us of that. He says in, in, in his letter, James chapter 1, he says, uh, "'Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds.'" because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. He says, consider it pure joy when you face trials. Not if you face trials, not maybe you will face trials, but when you face trials. And so we see that John is a partner with us in tribulation. But not only is he a partner in tribulation, he's a partner in the kingdom. He goes on to say, uh, I, John, your brother, and partner in the tribulation and in the kingdom. Now, if, if, if we were living in this time period, we might be thinking, what, why does he bring up the kingdom? All I see around me is suffering. All I see around me is, is pressure, governmental pressure against us that's trying to destroy this church. And yet he mentions the kingdom because the kingdom is being established. In the midst of tribulation, the kingdom is being established. I'll say this again. In the midst of tribulation, in the midst of suffering and pain and hard times, hardships, God establishes his kingdom. In fact, this is such a well-known truth that, that Tertullian, a an, an North African Christian writer, writes this thing, this statement that, that's well-known uh, throughout the ages. He says, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And what Tertullian was trying to tell us is that even though you, you, you persecute the church, even though you persecute Christians, even though you persecute them to the point of martyring and, and shedding their blood, that, that produces life in the church. There's, a, there's this sort of counterintuitive economy in the, in the economy of God where he takes the suffering of Christians and multiplies it to make his kingdom become established. And where martyrs die, new Christians are established. Where there is tribulation, the church flourishes. John understood that even through tribulation, the kingdom would continue to grow and be established. Family, if you are looking at your life, you're looking around and all you see is, is tribulation that, that cannot be accounted for by, by poor choices or sin choices, but it's just things that are happening in life, then let me encourage you, it's, it's entirely possible. It's, in fact, it's very likely that God is establishing his kingdom in your life. I'll say that again. If, if you look around at your life and you see that there are challenges and trials and, and tribulations that, that count, cannot be accounted for by your poor behavior, then it's very likely that in this moment, in this storm, God is establishing the kingdom in your life. God is able not to only to use the good things, but to redeem and use the evil in this world for your life and for my life. And so, in all of this, John calls us to patient endurance, to persevere. He says this, I'm a partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Christ Jesus, or that are in Jesus. John was exiled. He was likely separated from many, if not all of those whom he loved. And his practical ministry was now limited to what he could do in Patmos. He might have been tempted to quit, to give up on God in a situation that may have tempted to think that God had given up on him. 
but he, he perseveres, and we see that he is, he's seeking after God. This, this whole letter is a revelation that God gives him, but it's, it's likely that, that John was pursuing God, that he wasn't just running from God and God grabbed his attention and said, I want you to write this letter, but, but that he was receptive and waiting and seeking after God. He was persevering. He was ready and receptive. How do you respond in the middle of troubles? Do you question God's character and run away from him? Or do you patiently endure, endure and trust that he is both good and he is great? Do you hold on to your own beliefs about who God is? Or do you hold on to what he has told you, what he has shown you, both in, in the word of God and in past experiences, that he is good and he is great? He is good and he is for your good and he is also sovereign. John is a partner with us through trial, tribulation, through the establishing of the kingdom and, and through patient endurance. And it's all because he's a partner in Christ. He says this, I, John, your brother, and partner in the tribulation and in the kingdom and in the patient endurance. And he says this, that are in Jesus. He was saying all of these partnerships are in Jesus. It's in Christ that John is able to withstand tri tribulation. It's in Christ that John is able to see that the kingdom is going to thrive in the midst of tribulation. And it's in Christ that he's able to patiently endure as he waits for the return of Christ. And it's only as you and I seek to remain in Christ that we can endure the troubles, the trials, the tribulation that we experience. Are you in pain, family? Run to Jesus. Are you suffering? Run to Jesus. Are you unsure? Run to Jesus. If, you're in, if, you're, if your trust is in Jesus Christ, if your faith is in what he accomplished on the cross and the promise that he would return and, and fix everything, then your life is hidden in Christ and Christ is in you. There's this, this mystical union that we have as Christians where we are, we are united with Christ. We're not just uh, in the church and we're related to Christ and he's our buddy, but there's this connection where we're almost identified with Christ. Through his life and death and resurrection, we're, ex we're invited to experience the power of resurrection life. And it's not just power to to deliver us away from things, but it's power to deliver us through tribulation as the kingdom's being established. It's power that allows us to, to endure and push and, and persevere. Family, it, all of this hinges on the fact that we are in Christ. All of this hinges on the fact that we, we trust in Jesus. He's our brother, and he's our partner in tribulation, the kingdom, and patient endurance. And, and this, this is the framework through which we think about suffering. Family, are you suffering? Are you experiencing pain, affliction in your life that's, that's unrelated to, you, to your poor choices? And perhaps you're experiencing, experiencing the kind of tribulation that allows you to partner with Christ, to partner with the Christians around you, to, to make it through the tribulation to see the kingdom established in your life and ultimately to, 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 to create a kind of perseverance in you that's willing to hope and push and press toward the end, toward the goal of seeing your life uh, perfected in Christ. God is, he's with us and he's, he's waiting for us and he's with us now and he's calling us to trust him. He's calling us to persevere. He's calling us to see and call down the kingdom of God to be established in the midst of trials, in the midst of tribulation. Embrace the fellowship of suffering with Christ. Embrace the fellowship of suffering with Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we love you and we recognize that none of this is possible apart from the fact that, Jesus, you came and you lived a perfect life we should have lived and you died the death that we deserve and that you rose again, defeating Satan's sin and death so that we might be able to experience resurrection life, the kind of life that allows us to live through tribulation, not try to get around tribulation, but to live through it so that we might see the kingdom of God established in our lives and we might endure until the end. 
So Lord, we pray that you would do this in our lives, that you would establish your kingdom in our lives by whatever means you find necessary. Lord, help us to persevere and help us to trust and remember that our hope is in you. That like, like John, who was on, on Patmos, waiting, we wait for you. We look to you. If you've never trusted in Jesus, if you've never looked to him, to trust him as your Lord and Savior, to, to re- redeem your life from sin, this is a great moment to turn your life away from the things that you've trusted in and to trust in Jesus as your Lord, the one who rules your life, and as your Savior, the one who saves you from the, the penalty of your sin, namely death. If that's you, I would encourage you to pray with me. You could pray, God, I turn away from everything I know to be sin and I turn to you and I ask you to forgive me of my sin and to give me the way forward, Lord. Fill me with your spirit and let me walk out a life that's worthy of the salvation that you've already given me. I pray this in Jesus' name. If that's you, I'd love for you to let one of our chat hosts know so that we can celebrate with you and help you walk out this life of faith well. Well, family, we love you and we're thankful for all that you're doing. And we're excited to say that we are still doing amazing things in our community. We have, we have partnered with, with Mobile Hope and, and we've been doing a lot of things to support Sterling, Herndon. Uh, we've been even involved in, in Chantilly and a number of other places, but, but we are doing everything we can to love our community well. And so weekly, we've been taking this benevolence offering where we've taken these things, taken these funds, and used them to support individuals in our church and in the community so that we might be able to share the love of Christ by meeting physical needs. If you'd like to take part in this, we'd love for you to do that. You can do it one of three ways. You can write a check to Grace Covenant Church and write Sterling Benevolence in the memo and send that to our church office. Otherwise, you can click the Give link on our church website, gracecov.org slash sterling, or you can give through our mobile app. But however you give, I'm thankful for it. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for the generosity of your people. And we pray that you would use these funds for the good of your people and for the good of our community so that they might experience your love and be open to receiving your testimony and putting their faith in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, family, I love you. It's good to spend some time with you, and I can't wait to see you face to face. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.